I mean, that, that was a that was a legitimate argument people used. Um, well, I shouldn't say legitimate. That was a real argument people used. That was not a legitimate argument. <laughs> Yeah, it was legitimate to them, but you know, I mean, once you look at it, it's like oh, that's crazy that you know that because nobody really ever has the answers. Just to be honest with you, you know, like you might see it in movies, but nobody really goes into detail like that about this. So it's cool that you know that. I've heard that all my life, so that that's why that, that's why we were enslaved because we were, we were suffering the curse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which you know I've never <laughs> heard that. Yeah. I'm yeah. new to it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, really. Yeah. You guys, I'll let you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That appears to have been something that they came up with after, right? This wasn't something that the earliest people enslaved in Africans thought. Hey, you know what we're doing? We're fulfilling our biblical mandate. Now right. this comes after as they're being pushed to say. How can you be a Christian and justify this? So it's something that develops in the 18th and uh, the 1800s. Another another way that they approach this, um, the Southerners approach this, was that slavery did have a measure of approval in the Bible. Um, the old law provided guidelines for slavery. Um, slaves were uh, told by Paul to obey their masters. Um, so you know, the, there were there were passages in the Bible that um, now I wouldn't say they necessarily encouraged slavery, but regulated slavery. And so that was another thing that was used. But again, when you start going through some of those passages, um, you know there. The way slavery was talked about in, let's say, the patriarchal time or the time of the Law of Moses, um, that's not how slavery was practiced in the American South. And so they weren't following those guidelines, but they were saying, "Look, the Bible, um, the Bible approves it." Um, additionally, there was also the lack of condemnation. People in the South would argue. Uh, you know, there are no passages that say, thou shalt not hold slaves. And so, because it's not condemned, uh, they would argue that, um, that that was another way to justify slavery. Uh, you know, again, the, 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 the logical outgrowth of this is, is on shaky ground to begin with. But, you know, they're, they're trying to find some sort of Justification, and, and certainly by appealing to things like, well, Abraham had slaves, and the kings had slaves. Um, when Paul finds Onesimus, the runaway slave, he sends him back to Philemon, uh, and doesn't tell Philemon to release him. Now he does encourage him to send him back, but he doesn't tell him. That. Um, so, you know, you can see how they could provide, you know, these passages might help convince you that you could be. Uh, a Christian and hold people in slavery. But again, once you start probing some of this, it's it's on very shaky um, biblical ground. Um, it's just a question. Bear with the, and I, I'm not sure if I'm going to talk about but bear with the curse of hand and can, just from your perspective, how far do you think, well, you want to know, but how, how far do you think that curse might have gone? Because I, I know, doesn't it say in, um, in Exodus, a curse can go five, or Deuteronomy can go five generations. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's certainly, a, there's certainly like how far a curse can, can go. Uh, I think the focus, though, was not so much the African descendants of Ham, and there's like Egypt, which is was really the only <laughs> list it came, and people weren't enslaving Egyptians. Uh, you know, because a lot of Egyptians were Muslims by that point, uh, and so that's not where a lot of slavery slave was coming from. Uh, and it was more focused on the Canaanites and, you know, the, the how God was going to deal with the Canaanites. Um, okay. yes. So did the Canaanites, did they come from Canaan? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where the, the, they're descended from Canaan. So it has okay. to do more with uh, that aspect than it does anything to do with that. Okay, so really, it doesn't even consist of Africa. Hopefully. Yeah, I mean, holistically, right? Yeah, there's there's certainly you know some descendants from Ham that are 
that live or develop societies on the continent of Africa, but it's not not the entirety of Africa that's being looked at. I have a very distract. Okay, just depending upon how, how far the curse went down. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing too. Yeah, I mean, even if that, that had to do with that, is you know, it was long past before. Also related to this controversy in the Old South um, had to do with how much even ministers got into the idea that the separation between the North and the South was a noble religious calling. And so as people began to develop this idea of, of secession, and you know, creating a separate southern nation. Ministers provide relig provided religious justification for that. And and you know, argued that this was, was something that um, that God wanted. So the political conflict that's going on over slavery, over secession was understood in religious terms, that this was a, you know, a religious event, that, that God wanted this to take place, that he wanted the South, that the South was somehow more holy than the North, uh, and so, you know, separating, separation was, was important and was, was something uh, morally responsible. Additionally, when, so on the one hand, you have ministers preaching or, or people thinking of developing a separate southern nation as a religious goal. Right? It's not just a political thing, it's a religious thing. And then, when you have these elected officials talking about the development of a separate southern nation, the arguments that they are using were the same types of arguments that southerners used when the Baptist split, when the Presbyterian split, when the Methodist split. And so the same things that were used in the religious splits, the same types of language, uh, the same types of arguments were used to talk about the reason for a separate southern nation. And then finally, in all of this, the clergy, the ministers in the South, a lot of them were supportive of disunion. The, the development of a separate southern nation. That this was something that they felt needed to take place because um, this was the right thing to do. And so casting the the north as ungodly, the south as, as godly, was a very important um, you know part for a lot of the ministers as well. So this wasn't just a political issue; it was a religious issue also wasn't just an economic issue, it was a religious issue as well. So, so far we've been kind of focusing on um, the South. I want to turn and talk a little bit about the North in the midst of all this and some of the things that are, are going on in the North. Um, highlight some of the, um, the ways in which the North is religiously thinking about some of the same types of, of issues. So, so the divide um, between the two regions of the North and South was, was over slavery, the economy, and, and religion. Well, it, I mean, it, it predominantly, it, it's, it's slavery. Okay. And slavery is so tied into all those other things okay. that it just kind of envelops everything. And so religious people were trying to justify slavery. Religious people were trying to justify the creation of a separate southern nation. Slavery was vital to the economic well-being of predominantly a few people, but a lot of other people kind of tapped into that as well. Um, you know, the poor classes were... They were convinced by the state's rights issue, um, you know, because of you know, the other people. But, but ultimately, for the rich, it was, a, it was just a matter of, of slavery. Because that's where their wealth came from. And so it's just kind of, it's, it's all kind of 
wrapped up here together was uh, and it's just all so interwoven. Okay. In the north, uh, of course, uh, you know the, there is that expression of moral outrage. Now, again, not everybody in the north is um, is necessarily wanting to be involved in this from a religious standpoint or a moral standpoint, but religious people expressed moral outrage over slavery. Not all the religious people, but a lot of religious people. Not because they were necessarily, um, well, I mean, there were still a lot of racists in the North, too. And so it wasn't entirely because they believed in racial equality, but they just had a problem with slavery. And kind of one of the, mo one of the focal points of this moral outrage was kind of encapsulated in the book by Harriet Beecher Stowe called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, oh, before we get to Uncle Tom's Cabin, let me talk about abolition arguments. So a lot of the arguments for, by abolitionists were from scripture. So while the South would appeal to those passages that say slaves obey your masters, other things like that, abolitionists would talk about the passages where, you know, there is no slave uh, you know, is no slave or free, uh, talk about equality, talk about liberty, uh, you know, being free in Christ. And so the abolitionists would argue from that standpoint, would argue from the religious standpoint. Additionally, when um, we, we think about a lot of this moral outrage, um, a lot of the major abolitionists, um, people like William Lloyd Garrison, would use either religious language or would use religious white language um, to express their outrage. Um, Garrison wouldn't have necessarily been a traditional Orthodox Christian, um, but you know he certainly pushed forward the idea that there was a moral failing in the United States uh, in what was referred to as the peculiar institution. Um, now remember. Uh, you know, this is something major taking place in the United States, but similar types of discussions are taking place in other countries. England had just kind of abolished slavery in the, I believe, the 1840s. Um, but their slavery by this point had certainly not been any sort of extent like what we saw in the United States. And so there isn't that same kind of economic dependence on slavery like you see in the United States. And so it is somewhat easier um, to eliminate slavery in Britain than it was in the U.S. Um, certainly there's also the presence of slaves in the Caribbean, uh, presence of slaves in South America, and so similar types of discussions are happening, but it's you know, really becoming a major uh, religious and, and political and economic and whatnot issue in the United States. Frederick Douglass, uh, for example, is another abolitionist who would use religious language. Um, and, and Douglass, of course, um, would kind of compare the Christianity he found in Christ with the Christianity that was being practiced in the South and find the Christianity practiced in the South being wanting because of its justification of slavery. So now let's turn to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, so the tale is told that President Lincoln had the opportunity to, at one point, meet Harriet Beecher Stowe, who had written Harry, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And again, the story is that he said, well, here is the lady uh, who wrote that little book that started this great war. So there is, I mean, certainly Uncle Tom's Cabin is not the only or the primary way, reason for the Civil War. But it had a very important role in helping the North think about the human cause of slavery and think about it more than just an issue of states' rights or the power of southern states, but actually think about the human beings that were sunk in this system. Uh, you know, certainly today, Uncle Tom, well, I mean, from the 60s on, Uncle Tom has not been a uh, positive. Thing. Uh, you know, and so from the 60s and 70s, to call somebody an Uncle Tom, uh, you know, wasn't to uh, compliment them. But at the time, 
you know, this was uh, this was a very important work for Northerners in thinking about um, you know what what, uh, what slavery actually did to people. Uh, written in uh, 1852 by Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, she was the daughter of a man named Lyman Beecher. Uh, I believe we briefly mentioned him um, in when we were talking about um, the Second Great Awakening. Uh, her father had been a, uh, a revivalist and had been educated at Yale. And the entire family really was involved in abolitionism. Uh, and so they were all preaching against slavery. But uh, Harry Beecher, uh, who married a man named Charles Stowe, uh, who also is an abolitionist, um, has the most uh, impact on all of this. The book itself was uh, fairly successful. Um, in, from 1852 uh, to the Civil War, it sold 300,000 copies, which for the time is a huge bestseller. Um, and so it, it becomes a very popular work. And, and even afterwards, even after the Civil War, it remained a popular work. Um, but um, in the years after the publication, uh, it would be turned into a play. Uh, and so that people would see it that way. People were reading it, of course. One of the things that particularly comes out of Uncle Tom's Cabin is, is as I mentioned, this idea of, of the, you know, really understanding the, the human cost of all of this. And really makes people think about um, you know, the, the African Americans who are uh, part of this uh, peculiar institution and the impact it has on them. As she talks about a variety of, of different slaves who are uh, involved in this. Uncle Tom, of course, is the, the one that most people focus on because he's the, you know, he's the title character. But uh, you know, other people that uh, feature in there as they, they try to escape uh, slavery with their family, uh, you know, other kinds of things. And so, um, but in doing so, um, she does put forward some essentially racist type of views. Um, if there's anything like what we call positive racism, then it would be Uncle Tom's cat. But essentially, you know, a lot of what she argues is a, um, that there are certain racist, there are certain qualities of the African American race that should be appreciated. And one of those is the idea that African Americans were naturally religious. Now, certainly African Americans have uh, been a part of religious organizations in sizable numbers since even before the Civil War. But that has nothing to do with the nature of people. It's, there's a lot of cultural reasons uh, behind that. But the idea was that African Americans were somehow more naturally religious than whites. Uh, and that comes out in all of the characters, especially Uncle Tom. Uh, but even some of the, the bad African American characters. I mean, the African American characters, like the taskmasters who were working, uh, the people that end up helping beat Uncle Tom at the end of the, uh, the quote. Uh, not to spoil anything if you have read it. Um, that, uh, you know, that uh, somehow in this experience, their religious sense is awoken and, and they kind of have this conversion experience because of what they see uh, Tom going through. Um, and, and this kind of persists for a long time and, and even becomes, uh, you know, their, their social scientific justification, this assumption that somehow uh, Africans are, or people of African descent are, are more religious or, or more um, disposed to being religious than, than other races. Um, again, like I said, if, you know, if there was a positive racism, it would be this. I mean, you know, that's a, it's presented as a positive quality. But later on, it becomes a, a thing where a lot of racial, racist social scientists kind of argue that there's less development among African cultures because of superstition and other things like that. Yeah, it formulated the way the North saw, thought about slavery. The North thought about thought of thought about slavery. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Let me go back again. I'm I'm really just trying to save it so I won't lose none of this. Yeah. I, I need it. Oh goodness. Man, okay. Let me get this bullet right here. <laughs> Another thing that comes out of uh Uncle Tom's cabin, uh, in the way that still presents African American characters in there is that somehow um, African Americans who have gone through slavery uh, are, are closer, cl more closely connected with God. Now, it, it might have been that slavery, the conditions of slavery, might have brought an encouragement to be more religious, but the idea that a specific race is closer to God is again itself a, at the very least, a racialist notion. Um, but again, you know, it's meant to be a positive one because she's essentially trying to suggest how can we allow this to happen to this race that is connected closely to God. Right? So it's kind of the exact opposite of the curse of Cain. Right, the curse of Cain had been separated Africans so far from God. But she's arguing the exact opposite. And that there's something naturally religious about slaves that brings them closer to God. And then finally, uh, when you, you know, really look at the way that Uncle Tom is presented in the novel, he serves as a Christ figure. Um, he is gentle. Um, he is convinced, right? He's, he fully knows who he is as a person. Um, again, not to spoil it, he dies right? um, he, as, as, a, as a means to save others. And, and in his death, it leads to the conversion of, of other people. So, you know, that too kind of ties into all of this, uh, these ideas that, that uh, Stowe is putting forth about African Americans. So, you know, putting the human face on it, but again, you know, Stowe wasn't necessarily racist, racist but she was a racialist, and she was also paternalistic. Um, you know, there, there is a way in which certainly there are a lot of negative white people in Uncle Tom's cabin, but then there are also these kind of paternalistic types of approaches as if uh, Africans, uh, African Americans need white people to help them, which right, in some sense, okay, we could argue you know, in, in slavery there needed to be white people actually saying, hey, this is wrong, it's got to stop, um, because they wouldn't listen to people like Frederick Douglass, they wouldn't respect people like Harriet Tubman and, and other things. Um, What's the, uh, the definitional difference between a racist and a racial? Yeah, I would say that a racist would be something, someone who would, who would try to argue that based on the qualities of race, that that race is inferior. Okay. Where a racialist would argue that they wouldn't necessarily look as a, at a racial group as being inferior, mm -hmm. but would still try to assign certain inherent qualities to a race, okay. like they are naturally religious. Uh, that you know, and you don't you don't mean that in kind of like they're inferior, but that's still racialist in trying to say that there's something about a particular race. When I mean, ultimately, in a sense, race does not exist as a objective thing. Right? There's no genetic difference between the races, but race is something that we've invented based on pigmentation or skin. And so the assumption that because you have a certain pigmentation of skin or your parents or your grandparents or ancestors way down the line came from a certain region and so you are this way because you're part of this race. Um, and I mean, that, that doesn't seem to make any sense. <laughs> you know, when you look at it from like a biological standpoint uh, or even from a theological standpoint. 
So that's that's how I would define make a, a distinction between the two. Okay. One of them, yeah, yeah. one is 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 like an block the computer operative. Yes. Yeah. And, and so both of, both groups would say that there's something distinct about a race. One would say those distinctives make that group inferior to the group that is rep that I represent, right. where the other would say it's, it's not necessarily inferior. It's just so they might still buy into the same stereotypes. It's just one would look at it as well. That's a negative. That makes them inferior. Okay. I would you know I mean ultimately neither one of them are necessarily positive, but. <laughs> You know, I, I, I would say there is a difference in intent or the difference in the heart between the two groups. Ultimately, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin was written in response to uh, the Fugitive Slave Law. Um, there had been a Fugitive Slave Law passed uh, in the 1700s that essentially um, gave slave owners the right to retrieve any of their slaves that had escaped to the north. And so throughout the 1800s, when you look through the newspapers of the time, you will see a variety of advertisements of, you know, of particular slaves that they've escaped from their masters and, you know, the, the masters trying to get them back. The slave law was uh, the fugitive slave law of 1851, though, is the one that, um, that we're talking about here. It was enacted during the Compromise of 1850, essentially as an attempt to try and deal with a variety of issues that Congress was trying to deal with, uh, including what to do about California. It was just a few years before gold had been discovered in California. So California, a lot of people really quickly went out to California. And so it really quickly came up for statehood. So the question becomes, is California going to come in as a free state, or is it going to come in as a slave state? And so there's that issue. There's issue uh, about the lands that were uh, taken uh, after the war with Mexico. Um, and so included in this, from the southern standpoint, was a one in a fugitive slave law, stronger fugitive slave law than what was currently on the books. Specifically, this fugitive slave law required that federal marshals had to actively seek out runaway slaves. Previously, the position was, the standard was, if a slave was discovered, then they were to get that slave back to the master. So it was more of kind of a passive response of, you know, if one was happened upon. This was more of an active attempt to, uh, you know, go out and actually find runaway slaves. Of course, for a lot of free blacks in the north, that becomes a particularly troubling thing because how do you prove that you're not a slave? And, and so being able to prove that you're not, that you're, you were free born or that you had uh, been, you know, been freed or whatever, those, those kind of things. So it becomes not just a concern of people that are fugitive slaves, but it becomes a concern for uh, even those that have the freedom. A lot of prominent, prominent northern uh, religious people, of course, spoke out against it um, quite vocally saying they were not going to obey it. Uh, some of those included uh, senators like William Seward, uh, who was the senator uh, from New York at the time. Seward would go on to be uh, Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he was also responsible for the purchase of Alaska from the Russians. Uh, and so Alaska was known as Seward's folly um, because, you know, it didn't seem like he'd been purchased. But essentially, at the time, we're talking about Fugitive Slave Law. What year did they come out of that Sometime in the 1860s. I'm not sure. It doesn't become a state until the 1950s. Right. I think it was the Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they they bought the territory, but they don't. it's not a state until later on. Oh, so, so it has, has the U.S. on it since the 1850s? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
But essentially for this, Stewart said that, uh, that he was not going to obey the fugitive slave law because there was a higher law that he had to obey. Uh, essentially, the, of course, he's talking about this moral law, the biblical law, uh, that he feels um, would be against the fugitive slave law. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a uh, very prominent um, poet, uh, author, also very vocal against the uh, the fugitive slave law, and as well as Theodore Parker, a prominent uh, minister. What Emerson? Uh, Ralph Waldo. And he, was against, he was against it. Yes. Yeah. So these these are all Northerners against uh, against it, right? I thought this was interesting. Yeah. Parker uh, was actually involved in a group that helped finance John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry uh, as an attempt to try and uh, lead a slave revolt. So he too was, was active against it. The Civil War itself, of course, was thought of in religious terms. So there's a lot of religious thinking about this, of course, in the 19th century. And of course, a lot of people you know, are, are, are thinking about this very important thing that happens right there in the middle. On both sides, of course, they are using God to justify their actions, both claiming that God is supporting their side. So if you were a union, God wore blue. If you were better it, God wore gray, <laughs> but uh, he was on the side. Both of them, of course, and Lincoln points this out, prayed for God's blessing. Uh, both wanted their cause to succeed, felt that they had the righteous cause in all of this, um, and that the cause, the, the Civil War, was a sacred cause. It wasn't just a uh, some type of uh, political or military thing only. For a lot of people, it was a, a sacred cause. It was a, it was a holy endeavor. Oh, that's right. I was just trying to see what was next. I, had, I thought I knew what was next. We'll go ahead and finish there. Um, we'll finish up on Thursday with some of this and then also talk about some of these same issues and how they're impacting the restoration movement specifically. So you know, kind of put it, providing a framework here for the, the United States uh, culture and then kind of fitting the uh, restoration movement inside that. So we'll pick up with that more on Thursday.